Carrie Browsick. I'm a senior natural resource specialist and an agroforester, and I work at Snohomish Conservation District. I run an agroforestry program there where we do a lot of education and outreach around agroforestry. And I do a lot of work to get agroforestry practices planted around North Puget Sound. And I am also co-founder of Agroforestry Northwest. I put this up here because as you will learn as we go through the talk, food forests are part of a broader body of practices known as agroforestry. And so if after this talk today, you have some further curiosity, curiosity about agroforestry and what these systems are, um, this is a great resource to check out. This is going to be a resource for good information that pertains to the Pacific Northwest. There are a lot of great resources out there for agroforestry, a lot coming from the Midwest and the East Coast. So I know some of you are joining us from some of those areas. Um, but if you're looking for good Pacific Northwest resources, this is a great uh, place to check out. And so to jump into our talk today and to give everyone an idea of what I'm going to cover, kind of the flow of the talk, I am going to start with kind of a high level context um, that I'm going to place food forests within. I'm going to discuss the benefits of these systems. I think that's really important to understand these systems better and to understand why we would want to try and grow food and medicines this way. I am gonna talk about relationship to food forests and to our landscapes, because that might be a little bit different than some of the relationships we're used to when we work with our land. And then I'm gonna to start to get into some of the more practical aspects about these systems, considerations and targets that we have when we're trying to plant these systems, some design aspects. And I will talk about some species. The species I am going to mention are species that do well in the Pacific Northwest. Some of them will also do well in other areas of the country, but just keeping that in mind. Um, and then I'm going to leave you all with some resources if you desire to get started with implementing these types of systems on your own landscapes. So as I mentioned, food forests or forest farming are part of a broader body of knowledge or a broader set of practices called agroforestry. And if I were to boil agroforestry down to the bare, bare bones, um, essentially what agroforestry is doing is it is integrating trees back into our working lands or protecting trees that are already established on our working lands. And so there are two basic approaches to this. One approach is to go out into open space. Um, this may be an open field, it may be public property, it may be farmlands, and those types of spaces, and to integrate trees back into those systems. The other approach is to go into an already established forest ecosystem and to first do some practices that bolster the health of that forest ecosystem and then begin to intentionally cultivate certain crops within that forest understory. We also call these non-timber forest products. So these are the two approaches that agroforestry has on the landscape. And agroforestry is diverse, it's creative, it's vast, and it's expressed across the land in all kinds of unique and interesting ways. But in order for us to make sense of it and talk about it and study it, uh, we have to define it in some way. And so in North America, we have these five categories of agroforestry practices. So all those expressions that we see out there on the landscape, 
we put into one of these five categories of agroforestry. And these categories are defined by the USDA and our land grant universities. And so you can see the five categories here. And certainly food forests and forest farming are one of those five agroforestry types. And so that's certainly the one that we are going to talk more about today. So forest farming, food forests, we are really, when we're working with this practice, we are working with an ecosystem. And you're going to hear me use the word ecosystem a lot through the rest of this talk today, because that's what this is about. We need to start thinking in ecosystem type terms. And so within this practice, again, there are these two approaches. We can go into a wide open space. Maybe this is your backyard. Maybe it's um, an old area of lawn that you're not happy with anymore. Maybe it's an old field, um, an old pasture, um, but an open space. And what we do with this approach is we build a forest ecosystem with from the ground up, essentially. And within this forest ecosystem, we are choosing plants to put into our ecosystem that have some type of benefit food production, medicine, materials, or they serve, or plants that serve a specific function within our ecosystem that we want. So that's one approach. The other approach is the one I mentioned before of going into an already established forest ecosystem. And many of you joining us today may have some forest land on your property. So this is another approach to forest farming or food forests, is to go into that already established ecosystem to do some good forest health practices to start with. So that may include things like selective thinning. It may include things like planting certain um, successional species out within your forest to build biodiversity. And then once you have that established, you're going to start to choose specific plants, foods, medicines, materials that you're going to intentionally cultivate within that already established forest ecosystem. So this is different than going into the forest and foraging or wild crafting. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the intentional cultivation within this forest ecosystem. So I like to use this graphic because I think it starts to get at the complexity of these systems and what we're getting out of them. You can see that when we're working with an ecosystem, an ecosystem is complex, it's diverse, it's creative. And so we get a lot of production benefit out of these systems. We can produce a lot of different types of things within a relatively small concentrated space. And at the same time that we're getting all of this production, meeting food and medicine and material needs, we're also getting all of these ecosystem services and ecological benefits because we're working from an ecosystem model. And so this graphic tries to express that. And we can see here some of the vast types of things that we can grow within one of these systems. So everything from the root layer, root crops, all the way up to high canopy tree layers, nuts, fruits, herbs, seeds, um, honeys. We can get syrups out of these systems and essential oils. We can get wood products and cuttings and all types of things. At the same time, we are increasing habitat and biodiversity. We are getting a system that is starting to perform nutrient cycling and building soil health. We're getting water quality benefits that come with these systems and climate change mitigation, carbon sequestration, we're creating microclimates, so we're getting climate modification. 
So you can start to see the complexity, the benefits that are built into a system like this. And I do have to say that this is nothing new. What is new about this is the terminology we might be using. What is new about this might be some of the plants that we're integrating into our system. What's new about this is the growing body of science and knowledge and research around these systems. But these practices are nothing new. There are thousands of years of human history of growing foods and medicines and materials in this way. And we have examples all over the globe of indigenous peoples, native peoples that have grown foods in this way for many, many years. And certainly here in the Pacific Northwest, in our own environment, in our own ecosystems, the coastal Salish peoples who lived here grew food in this way. And I'm referencing a study here on this slide that talks about this very thing and some remnants of some of these forest gardens, they call them, that they have found and have been studying. And what I want to do for a moment is have everybody just kind of relax and sit back and take a deep breath, maybe close your eyes. We're going to do a little bit of a visualization. I want to read a quote from this study to you all and just have you visualize, see if you can see yourself walking through this system, if you can, you know, visualize what it might look like, what sounds you might have heard, what the smells might have been like, how the sun might have played um, on the landscape. So while I read this to you, just visualize in your mind what walking through this system might have been like. So on lands covered in forests, dominated by hemlock and cedar trees, these forest gardens represent abrupt departures from the surrounding ecosystem. The dark, closed canopy of the conifer forest opens up and is replaced by a sunny, orchard-like spread of food-producing trees and shrubs, such as crabapple, hazelnut, cranberry, wild plum, and wild cherry. So you can really visualize what a system like this, what our Native peoples what these would have looked like, what it might have been like to be within these systems. And what's interesting about this study is it goes on to talk about that not only did these systems meet the needs of the humans that tended them, but they had an overall beneficial impact on the surrounding ecology. So these systems brought in greater biodiversity, created more habitat for a wider range of birds and mammals and those types of things. And so it really speaks to a role of humans as a keystone species within their environment. Humans as an animal acting on their environment to meet their needs while having an overall beneficial impact on the overall ecology of that system. And that's how any keystone species, you know, interacts with its environment. And so humans, certainly we have human history where humans fit in to their ecosystem in this way. And so I want you to keep that in your mind as we talk further about food forests. And so to define these systems out a little bit, we are talking about perennial polycultures here. Like any forest ecosystem, a forest ecosystem is dominated by perennial plants. They are polycultures. We're not talking about an orchard, right? We're not talking about an acre, five acres of apple trees. We are talking about a polyculture, just like a forest ecosystem. And within this polyculture, we have all these different multi, 
purpose plants. We're mimicking, we're designing, we're building that function of a forest ecosystem. So each plant has a niche and it's filling a purpose within our ecosystem. And these systems are really asking us to expand our horizons and thought when we're out on our landscapes, thinking about how we're going to interact with these spaces, right? It really asks us to get out of our horizontal plane of thinking and really start to bring in all these vertical planes into our system, right? And stack everything on each other, right? So get out of this kind of horizontal thinking of, well, here's my lawn, or here are my raised garden beds, or even here's my apple orchard. And start thinking about all these vertical spaces and how we can stack them all on top of each other. So really expanding our spatial thought patterns within our landscapes. But these systems are also working with su successional sequence as any ecosystem does. They change over time. And so these systems are also asking us to think about our landscapes over longer time horizons as well and adapt and change and pay attention to how these systems are going to look different from year to year. Your food forest is going to look very different on year one than it's going to look at year five or year 10. It's going to have different needs. It's going to produce differently and you're going to interact with it differently across time. And you are going to be a keystone species within this system and you are going to interact with it and help move it through different successional sequences over time. So expanding our horizons, expanding our thought and our way we view our landscape um, spatially and over time. And so these systems might be sounding very complex, um, and maybe a little bit daunting. And why would we even want to mess with this or attempt to dive into something like this. Um, well, this is the classic image here, right? A calm body of water and dropping something into that pond, a pebble, a leaf, and we get these rippling waves, these ripples that start to expand out from the center and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I use this imagery to express the benefits that growing our food, meeting our needs in this way, the benefits that they afford and the way those benefits ripple out from our own personal landscapes, out to our communities, out to a regional level, and even in some instances out to a global scale level. And I'll explain that a little bit here. So when we start to plant a food forest, we get these on-site immediate benefits, these benefits that we get personally on our own landscapes and for ourselves. We get all this new production potential, right? We can grow a lot of different things now within a fairly tight space, if that's what we have to work with. Uh, we get all these environmental benefits that come with these systems. We get nutrient cycling in our soils. We get water quality and water infiltration and water holding benefits. We get habitat benefits, pollinators and beneficial insects and all of those ecological benefits. Um, if you're a farmer, if you sell food um, from your landscape, you get access to new markets and some economic resiliency that you can start to build into your system. So a lot of immediate benefits that we get for our own landscapes when we start to grow food in this way. And then those benefits certainly ripple out into our community. Very few of us grow food on our own landscapes and keep all of that food just to ourselves. I know that when I grow food on my humble acre property, 
I share that food with my extended family. I share that food with coworkers. I share that food with neighbors. I have donated food to food banks at times, right? We end up growing a lot of times a lot more food than we ourselves can consume. And that food gets shared out to a community. Maybe we have a little farm stand and we sell food or we sell food at farmer's markets. And because these systems are diverse, they have a lot of genetic diversity of foodstuffs, of crops within them. And they expand the nutritional profile that is available now to the community around this system. They also are being studied and researched for their implications of being sort of storehouses, if you will, of this genetic diversity. And this has implications as we are moving through a changing climate. It has implications for food security and these systems are being studied for that. These systems have genetic diversity within them, wherein if the climate changes and food crops that we may be used to growing in our region are not faring as well, these systems, we can tend to find genetic food stuffs within these systems that may be adapting to a new climatic regime that may be faring better. And if we have those genetics within our community, growing within our communities, we are much more easily able to adapt more quickly to changes in our climate. So big implications for food security as well. And it's not just our human community. These benefits ripple out to our plant and animal communities as well. As we build diversity into our systems, as we get trees into our systems, we get a boon of biological diversity that comes in and we create a lot of habitat. And this is literally from the ground up. I could give a whole talk just about what happens in the soil profile when you get established tree roots within that soil profile. The genetic, the biodiversity that is built within that soil profile just amplifies and is incredible. So literally from the soil up through our plant communities, up to beneficial insects and pollinators, to birds, to small mammals, all of these creatures benefit from us growing food in this manner. And as we create this habitat, as we do this at scale, as more and more of us plant these systems on our lands, that reverberates out even to a regional scale. Many of us have water that flows through our landscapes. The water quality benefits of these systems is huge. The ecosystem services certainly don't stay on our land. They reverberate out to the surrounding region. And we can begin also to heal essential habitat or wildlife corridors and create essential habitat back on the landscape for many of our local species. So rippling out to region, regional benefits as well. Resiliency. These systems are being studied, they're being monitored, data is being collected to their resiliency when we are facing extreme weather events, a changing climate. I'm not saying that these systems don't sustain damage. They sustain damage like any other natural system does, but they recover more quickly. They can stay productive throughout an extreme weather event in some fashion. They are definitely more resilient. The more diversity you have, the more resilient your landscape is going to be. So it definitely benefits to a community, to a region, when we're talking about building resiliency to climate change. Climate change mitigation, another huge growing body of science and research 
on the benefits of these systems, on their abilities to sequester carbon and be a tool for climate change mitigation. And I just, I'm not gonna bore you with a ton of statistics about that, but I do wanna highlight this one bit of research that was done by a local scientist here in Washington State, Dr. Lynn Carpenter Boggs. And she was looking at different farming practices. And these are practices that we um, call carbon farming practices, right? So they're practices that farmers can put on their landscapes that we know can sequester carbon on farmlands. And so she was looking at these different practices and she was calculating their ability to sequester carbon. And so we see these numbers on the left-hand side here. And what these numbers represent are gigatons of carbon per acre per year captured and stored. And then we see the various practices at the bottom here. And then what we see on the right-hand side are various counties within Washington state. And these counties were chosen because they represent different soil types and they represent different climate types within Washington state. So when you're talking about sequestering carbon, the kind of soil and the kind of climate you have play into your calculations here. And so she was trying to capture all of this through this study she did. And what we see is, you know, some of these carbon farming practices have some great potential. Um, different types of tillage certainly have good potential. Uh, rotational grazing, that's what that represents, has a lot of potential. Then Dr. Carpenter Boggs started to integrate trees into these systems. And we can see the carbon capturing, carbon storage potential when we start to implement practices like food forests and like other agroforestry practices on our landscape. And so this has global scale implications, certainly. So those benefits rippling out from our own landscape where we plant a food forest out to our community, out to our region, and having some global scale implications. So I wanna just take a quick pause here. We're about to transition into some more practical aspects of this. Um, so if you've been waiting for that, fear not, we're going to get there. Um, but I do just wanna pause for a second because we've covered a lot already. We've talked about food forests as an agroforestry practice. We've defined food forests a bit and talked about what they are. We have talked about the different benefits that these systems bring when we start to plant them. And I want to touch again, I touched on this before, we talked about the history, the human history of these systems. And so I wanna pause here and just touch on the idea of relationship again, just really briefly, because I think that's key to these systems. Um, so these systems are asking us to have a little bit different relationship with our landscape than we might be used to. They're asking us to kind of step back and sort of give up that sort of command and control um, aspect of dealing with our land, give up sort of that dominion kind of mindset with our landscapes. And they're asking us to hand over a lot more of what goes on with these systems back to nature and to allow these natural ecosystem services to be restored and to start to do a lot of the work for us. And so they're really asking us, like the Native peoples did, to kind of step back and be more of a keystone species within our systems and not necessarily this dominion, you know, dominion over the system, command and control actor upon it. Um, and this is kind of freeing in a way, because what it allows us to do is it allows us to become more of a student of our landscapes and to not have to have all the answers necessarily. 
if you plant a food forest, if you already have a food forest, you are going to learn so much from your food forest. Your forest is going to teach you so much about your land, about the different interactions that can occur, about the ecosystem services and what nature will provide for you on your landscape. You are going to be able to sit back and be a student and learn and have this conversation over time with your landscape. And this allows you to make mistakes because we all know that making mistakes is one of the best ways to learn, right? We're not all going to be experts on our landscapes right off the bat. We're not all gonna get it exactly right with our design or with where we plant things. We're all gonna make mistakes. These are pictures of my food forest. I make mistakes still all the time. <laughs> and I always am continually learning so much. Um, you may plant a tree in the wrong place. You may have a shrub that dies. You may need to move plants around or do something different than what you originally thought you were going to do. And that's okay, because that's the relationship that these systems are asking for you to have with them. So I just wanted to take a moment and talk about that a little more. And so now we're, we're going to get into some more of the practical aspects of these systems and putting them into practice on our landscapes. So to get started, um, depending on what kind of resource you look at, I've seen everything between five layers of production to nine layers of production. But commonly what we see out there are around seven layers of production that we have to work with within a food forest system. And we can start relatively simply with something that we would call a tree guild. And this image that you see here represents a, a real simplistic tree guild. This is like a mini forest ecosystem that someone could plant in the corner of their backyard in a relatively small space. Um, but we're starting, we're starting to build in these different layers and getting a lot of production out of even something as simple as just a tree guild. And so we, you can see we have this high tree canopy layer, and you can envision this in a normal forest ecosystem that you've walked through in the past, right? You always have that high canopy layer, those, those really tall dominant trees, right? So this is one of the layers in our system. And then you have that mid canopy layer, those shorter trees that grow around those big tall dominant trees. And within our system, we have this as well. And then we have our shrub layers, we have our herbaceous layer, we even have a root layer, ground covers, and a vine layer. And I've even seen a fungal layer mentioned in here as well. And in the Pacific Northwest, as we all know, we definitely have a lot of potential with our fungal layers um, within systems like this that we can play around with. So these are kind of just the basic structure of our food forest. And as I mentioned before, we're playing with time horizons as well. And we're, pay, we're playing with the idea of successional stages. And a forest ecosystem goes through this as well, right? We have that bare ground. There's been disturbance of some kind, whatever it is. Maybe it's man-made disturbance. Maybe it's a natural disturbance. And now we have this bare space. And those pioneer plants move in. We usually identify them as weeds. But these are always very important plants serving very critical functions to build soil health and to prepare the soil for these older, more perennial plants that are going to move in in the coming years. And so those plants start to move in and prepare the soils further. And then you get your shrubs and then you get your pioneering trees in our environment. Those would be represented by things like alder and cottonwood. And then you start to get your apex, your climax forest trees. 
And in our ecosystem, those are represented by our conifers, right? Our cedar, our Douglas fir, those types of trees. And so within our food forests, we are shooting for that intermediate successional stage. And we are avoiding the climax forest stage. Why are we doing that? Because the e intermediate stage is where we get the most biodiversity. And if you think back to our visualization that we did and that little quote that I read to you, that's what native peoples were doing on within the ecosystem when they tended their food forests. They would go in and use various methods of disturbance or they would take advantage of natural disturbance to get back to that intermediate succession. And that description described that perfectly to us, right? As you walked out of the dark closed canopy forest, right? That was your, your climax forest succession stage, that conifer dominant dark understory climax forest. You would walk out of that into a sunnier, more open, intermediate succession forest with all these different species and all this different habitat. And that is certainly what we are going for when we do our food forests as well. And, you know, we're going to be that keystone species within our system to keep our system at that stage. First off, to get it to that stage, if we're starting with an open space, and then to kind of keep it at that stage. And we're gonna do things like come in and create some disturbance. We might thin out a tree. We might do some pruning. We might do things like that to keep our forest in this intermediate succession. And when we're considering what we wanna put into our food forest, we want to consider the plants that we're going to incorporate. And what we're shooting for is cooperation between organisms. And this is what, this is how a normal forest ecosystem functions. All these different plants grow within the system in their defined niche, and they all serve a function. And we're learning more and more about how all these different plants, how all these different animals actually cooperate within the ecosystem that they're in. I know we've heard a lot in the past about survival of the fittest and it's a doggy dog world out there in nature, um, but there is a lot of cooperation within nature. And we are trying to learn about that and capture that within our own food forest ecosystem. Kari, you're about to interrupt me. <laughs> yes, Carrie, there's um, a question um, of what is pictured on the right in this slide. Um, yes, this is a tree guild, the, the green. The, so on yeah. the right is a tree guild. You've got an apple tree, you've got comfrey growing under it um, and things like that. Yeah. Um, and then I will talk about the picture on the left as well, um, because within our forest ecosystem, and so bringing in the picture to this, you see this comfrey, this vegetative layer under here growing under this apple tree. Comfrey is a cooperative plant with apples. Comfrey helps provide nutrients to that apple tree. It brings in pollinators to that apple tree. And it, these two organisms cooperate together very well in a food forest. So that's an example of that. Um, when we're building out these systems, we're trying to get to what we call additive yielding. And the best way, the best example of additive yielding is the three sisters. And that is what's represented in this drawing on the left-hand side here. And I know most of us have learned about the three sisters. I remember learning about the three sisters in fourth grade. What the three sisters are is that native, they're a Native American system of growing 
these three crops together to get additive yielding. So what the native peoples knew is that when they took these three crops of corn, of beans, and of squash, and they planted them together, these plants cooperated. They supported one another. And what they ended up with was higher production, more food when they planted these three crops together than if they separated these three things apart and planted them all out in their own field by themselves. This is what we call additive yielding. And this is what we're also trying to build into our food forests. And so there are various ways to establish a food forest on your landscape. Um, there's a whole spectrum of ways. <laughs> And if you have a food forest or if you've, uh, if you've dealt with these before, or interacted with these systems before, you're going to understand that um, you're, there's going to be all kinds of ways and, 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 you know, ways that you're going to adapt with this over time. But what I'm going to talk about, just to give you an all an idea of how you might start one of these systems, I'm, is I'm going to kind of talk about two ends of the spectrums of how you can get started. So I'm going to talk about instant successional planting and then relay planting. And you may fall with your food forest somewhere in between these, but this will just give you an idea of how these systems get started. So with instant succession, you sort of begin with the end stage of your forest in mind and you work backwards from there. So you may have a great area with nice soil and you're ready to rip out the grass or to take out the row crops or do something different there. And you're ready to go and you've got some money and you've got some time and you've got some labor and you can kind of put all of this up front and design your system from the end from the end stage back so how you would do this is you would say okay i want to have you know three walnut trees and they're going to be 50 feet apart at their end stage and i'm going to want to have four apple trees and they're going to need to be you know 30 feet off and then i'm going to have berry bushes right and so you're going to consider at the end of the life of your forest, at that intermediate successional stage, how big your trees are going to be, how far apart they're going to need to be placed, where your shrubs are going to fit in, and you kind of plant that all out right at the get-go. So you plant in those trees, those shrubs, and you work your way back from there. And so this is a large investment up front. It's a large workload up front, um, but once you have that end structure all laid out, all put into the landscape, then adding in the ground layers, adding in the herbaceous layers and things like that, um, and kind of maintaining moving forward can be a bit easier as you move through time with your food forest. So that's instant succession planting. On the other end of the spectrum, we have relay planting. And this is really, really good for degraded sites. Maybe you have, you know, maybe they've ripped up some asphalt in an area, or maybe you are on new construction and they've built you a new home and scraped off all your topsoil. That's a thing that happens a lot. Um, whatever it is, these are really appropriate for sites where your soil maybe isn't great. It's not really ready to handle big trees and shrubs and support them well. And so with this type of planting, you would start with that first successional stage, like that previous slide I showed. You would start with these early successional nutrient building species. Um, that are going to 
bring a lot of nitrogen into the soil and other minerals and build the organic matter and those types of things. And you may just do that for a couple of years. Maybe you'll bring in some compost and add that in. And then you're going to start to integrate your shrubs, right? Because now the system can tolerate those shrubs. And once those shrubs are doing well and thriving, now maybe you're going to start to bring in some of your trees because now the soil, the system can support the health of those trees. And so that looks much more like that previous slide I showed with natural forest succession. And this is what we call relay planting and is certainly another way that you can start to establish a food forest. Um, this may also be if you don't have all the resources up front, right? And you start with just certain layers and as you get more resources and more time, you build your food forest up from there. Little bit about scale. These systems can be scaled, as I mentioned earlier, anywhere from a little tree guild, and that's what we see here, fruit tree guild, with you know, a tree and shrubs and an herbaceous layer and maybe a vine, um, you know, between a, a driveway and a house, um, all the way up to acres and acres of a food forest. Right? So these are very scalable um, to whatever type of landscape you have available or want to work with. And you know, they can be constructed so many different ways as well. Because they're diverse, because they're complex, you can really build your food forest to be more focused on food and material production, or you could be, you could build your food forest to be more focused on the aesthetics and the pollinator habitat, for example. And maybe the food is just a secondary benefit for you. So all different focuses, different goals, different aesthetics that you can design into these systems as well. And so with a food forest, with, with a normal forest, a normal forest has uh, these three components to it. A natural forest ecosystem is a self-renewing ecosystem. It grows back year after year. It's there. We don't have to go in as humans every year and replant the forest or anything like that. It's a self-renewing system. A forest ecosystem is a self-fertilizing system. A forest ecosystem is a self-maintaining ecosystem. And so we are trying to mimic this, these aspects within our own food forests. And so how can we bring in this self-renewing aspect into our food forests? Well, again, focusing on those perennials. If we do have annuals within our food forest, maybe we're focusing on self-sowing annuals. Many, many of the vegetables that we treat as annual vegetables in our raised garden beds can be self-renewing if we let them go to seed and do some self-sowing. So bringing in those types of annuals, focusing on dominating our system with perennials. This will help our system be a self-renewing system and really concentrating on the soil and making sure that we have a good, healthy soil ecosystem. Keeping cover on our soil like mulch or ground covers, minimally disturbing our soil. Yes, you're going to disturb your soil when you establish these systems, right? But once you get those trees and shrubs into place, not doing a ton of digging and turning your soil over year after year, minimal disturbance to allow those ecosystem services to really build and generate within your soil profile. So these are ways that we can engage with these self-renewing aspects of our food forests. The self-fertilizing, how can we bring this into our food forests? 
we can choose nitrogen fixing plants to be part of our food forest. And I have some of these plants represented here. You see this um, image of this shrub with the red berries. And we have a shrub here with um, orange berries on it. These are both nitrogen fixing shrubs. These shrubs both offer as well an edible, highly nutritious berry for our consumption. And in the spring, they have these lovely flowers, fragrant flowers that attract a lot of pollinators. So several functions that these shrubs here bring to the system. This one with the red berries is called the gumi. And this one with the orange berries is called the sea berry. And so bringing these nitrogen fixers into our system. Clover, we all know clover is a nitrogen fixer, also good for pollinators. Bringing these types of plants into our food forest. And then we have dynamic accumulating plants that we can also bring in. I talked about the apple tree and the comfrey earlier in that one image. This is another picture of comfrey. Comfrey is known as a dynamic accumulating plant. It has deep root structures. The comfrey plant takes up all kinds of minerals from the soil profile and concentrates those minerals. And when that comfrey plant dies back, and we let it decompose back into the soil profile that feeds the plants all these essential minerals and nutrients around it. A dynamic accumulator. Yarrow is another example of a plant that does that, attracts pollinators, and is great for feeding our food forest ecosystem. So these are ways that we can bring these self-renewing aspects or self-fertilizing aspects rather into our forest ecosystem. Self-maintaining, our forest ecosystems probably aren't going to be totally self-maintaining unless we want them to go feral. Um, and that might be perfectly appropriate for your landscape. Um, but most of us are going to want to be working with our forest ecosystem over time, as I spoke about before. And so what we're getting at is a lower maintenance type of, of system here. Um, you're going to have that initial work and investment up front. You're going to have that time when you're getting that system established. But once you get that establishment in place, once you get some of these self-renewing and self-fertilizing aspects in place, then you are going to be that keystone species within your system. You might be doing some extra mulching. You might be pulling out some weeds. You might be creating some disturbance by pruning or thinning. Um, and then certainly you're going to be harvesting from your food forest. And so to get started on your landscape with one of these, um, you do wanna do this with some intention. You wanna consider and think about this. And one of the best ways to start is by doing just a basic site assessment, right? Considering what type of soil you have. Do you have a heavy, wet soil that stays saturated all through winter and, and into most of the spring? Do you have a really gravelly or sandy soil that drains really well and gets droughty? Um, is your soil degraded? Is it high in, in compost, in beneficial organisms? Is it a healthy soil that you're starting with? What is the aspect of your land? Are you trying to plant a food forest on a slope? Are you on flat land? What is your climate like? What is your microclimate like? My yard has a different microclimate than the yard, you know, a half a mile down the street, for example. So what is your microclimate? What does the sun look like? Are, you know, are you trying to establish your food forest in a relatively shady spot? Or is it an open spot that gets a lot of sun, right? All of these types of considerations 
on your site on where you're wanting to establish your food forest. This will get you started. And then you're going to want to design. And I just have a few examples of some designs here just to give an idea um, and to, to show what different food forests can look like um, in different spaces. This one, we can see they have a high canopy tree in that English walnut. Um, they have a lot of these mid canopy trees with these uh, fruit trees. They have nitrogen fixers here. A black locust tree is a nitrogen fixer. Um, they've got berry bushes interspersed. You can see the blueberries they have here. Um, they have another, this caragana is a nitrogen fixing shrub. So they've done that self-fertilization in their system. They put their cane berries at the periphery because they know that those are gonna need more sun and that they can get out of control. Um, and then they've expressed here all the different things they're going to put at the ground level, right? They're taking advantage of the root layer through carrots and daikon and, and turnips. They are integrating things that are going to give them some pest control, like alliums and daffodils that repel um, squirrels and things. They're going to use climbers like beans and peas. So just an idea of what a food forest design can start to look like. This would be an example of a community food forest. They've got trails going through. They have a few trees um, and then they have a lot of shrubs. So not as tree dominant, more shrub dominant, and that's fine. They have a few high canopy trees, but again, mostly lower canopy types of things. Um, and they have this one it hasn't gotten as mature as working with the ground level yet, and that's fine. Um, these things all change over time. And then this is the beacon food forest. Many of us who live around here in Washington um, on the west side may be familiar with the beacon food forest. I like to use this because I like to show that you can do something as simple as sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and some colored pencils and just draw out your ideas, right? It's not about having the fanciest design and having everything thought out all at once. Like I said, you're gonna adapt and learn from your system over time. It's just about the intention of thinking about it before you begin. Um, so you have some intent, you have some thought put into it, and you can start with some good, well thought out intention. So it can be as simple as this. And then I just want to talk about some of the species of plants that you can incorporate into your food forest that do well in our region. And I know some of you are joining us from other parts of the country or maybe other parts of the globe. Um, and some of these species may do well in your region too, um, but there are all kinds of resources out there to find species that will do well in your food forest, no matter what area you are joining us from. And so in our region, those high canopy trees are going to usually be represented by some sort of nut tree. Um, and so in, we've got walnut, chestnut, heartnut, the monkey puzzle tree that does well. We have the locust that does well and fixes nitrogen for us. We have the alder. Our native alder is a nitrogen fixer um, that can grow in our high canopy tree layer. We have a low canopy layer, and those are usually going to be our fruit trees, like I've said before. And here are some of the species that do well in our region, in our food forests. Our, you know, typical apple, pears, and plums. The American persimmon can do quite well here. Quince does very, very well. Um, the hazelnut. Of course, we have our native, native hazelnut, but many varieties of hazelnut that do well. Mulberry figs, elderberries, the pawpaw is something native to the East Coast, but we have varieties here 
that can thrive in a Northwest food forest. The shrub layer to give just an idea, these are by no means exhaustive lists. The palette of plants that you have to work with to create your food forest is vast. I am just giving you a, a just scratching the surface of ideas of some of the plants that you can incorporate in your food forest. And so we get to that berry layer, blueberries, currants, josta berries, the gumi and sea berries that I mentioned earlier, uh, goji berries, honey berries, the tea plant. Camellia sinensis is the plant that we get green tea, black tea, white tea from. And we have varieties of this plant that grow well in our region. The tea plant, I'm going to talk about a little bit because I think it's um, descriptive of how we can build out our food forest. The, tree plant, uh, the tea plant in its native environment is a forest understory plant. It grows under higher canopy trees. And when it grows that way, it has more nutritional content, better flavor, um, it thrives better, it's more protected. So we could incorporate this into our food forest, understanding that as our trees get bigger and older, this tea plant is going to be just fine in that shaded space. The same with honeyberry and currants, right? they do relatively well and still thrive and produce in a fair amount of shade. Um, so, you know, this is some of the thought that we can put in to our system. We may plant blueberries up front, and as those trees get older, those blueberries, we may have to move them, but the currants may be fine where they're at for a long, long time. Did you have something for me, Kari? I do. What is that blue flower shrub? I, I don't know what it is. Somebody asked. Um, this, this shrub with the blue on it, and I'll, I can tell you what these are. So this shrub here with the blue, this is the honeyberry. Um, and it is, oh gosh, the flavor is kind of like a blueberry and the, the berries grow in these oblong shapes like this. One of the earliest ripening berries in our region uh, the one down in the corner with the flowers is the Camellia sinensis, the tea plant. The one uh, with these red berries here is the, um, the goji berry. And then we have um, currants here, champagne currants. Um, those are what those pictures are. Vine layer, here are some examples of vines that we can grow in our food forest and do well here. Um, we see some common ones, we see some uncommon ones, um, but remembering that we have this vine layer to work with. And vines can be interesting too. You know, we can build a structure for our vines to grow on. We can also use, you know, use our mistakes. Um, I know in my food forest, I had a tree that died, just, it just didn't get established, it just didn't do well, and it died. And I just kind of pruned it back, and I kept it there, and I grew a vine on it. It was, it was a built-in structure. So my mistake turned into something I could use later in my food forest. Um, so incorporating vines into, if you are so ambitious, Perennial vegetables, so many vegetables that are perennial in nature that do well in the shade. So many greens that we can grow that do very well in the shade of our food forests and actually may do better um, when they have some of that protection. And so these are just some of the perennial vegetables that you could incorporate into your food forest at the ground level. And we can see here, we have pictures of ramps, we have pictures of artichoke and pictures of fiddlehead. I think in our area, the lady fern and the ostrich fern um, will give us um, edible fiddleheads within our food forests. I also wanna talk about native plants. Again, we are 
we have our ecosystem hats on, right, with our food forests. We're thinking about our food forests as an ecosystem. And so why not bring in all these amazing native plants that we have. And for those of you joining us from other parts of the globe or the country, I am focusing here on Northwest natives, um, but look around your areas and discover what types of amazing edible or medicinal natives you have in your own region. Um, or natives that are going to serve a function in your food forest. Maybe it's a native that is going to be a nitrogen fixer or that's going to bring in beneficial insects. But in our area in the Pacific Northwest here in Western Washington, we have all these beautiful natives that are edible or provide medicine or some or materials or things like that. And we can certainly use those within our food forest. And I would encourage you to incorporate natives in our food forest. It really amplifies the ecosystem services that you'll be able to build in. It amplifies the habitat. It amplifies all of those benefits within your food forest ecosystem. And so some of the images I have here, this is our Western crab apple, our uh, Pacific crab apple, our um, Oregon grape um, with the edible grapes. I've seen recipes to use these uh, berries. Um, we have very, we have all kinds of native huckleberries and blueberries that grow in our region. Um, this, we have native greens. This is the stinging nettle. And I know many of you may not want stinging nettle um, in your food forest, especially if you have small children or, or pets or things like that. But a highly, highly nutritious green, um, a good plant for many insects. Um, I have incorporated this in my food forest. Um, we have camas here, uh, stone crop, and um, nook rose, which has roses are edible, and then the the um, rose hips, the berries, uh, if you will, on the rose um, are then very nutritious. And the nook rose has really big, juicy kind of rose hips um, that are great in the fall. So all kinds of amazing natives that you can bring into your system. And then those plants that may not, you may not eat them, but they're going to add to your ecosystem. They're going to fill a niche, they're going to bring a benefit. And that may be attracting pollinators, that may be attracting beneficial insects or providing some habitat for songbirds or whatever it is. And so here are just, um, some of our native wildflowers that would be lovely to incorporate into a food forest um, to bring in not only those ecosystem benefits and habitat benefits, but also just some visual interest and some beauty into your system as well. Here are some good resources. If, if after this, you've decided that this sounds like a good idea and you're going to want to attempt something like this on your own landscape, um, these are some great books that you can check out. I will say this first one here, this Edible Forest Gardens, here's an image of it here. That is if you really, really want to do a deep dive into the ecosystem considerations and structures of these systems and really get into the different plants and the roles that they can play in the interactions. This is a two volume, real, real deep set of knowledge. Um, so just, just to let you know that up front. Um, this other one is, you know, much more approachable, maybe if you just want some more information. But these are all great uh, books, resources that you can start with if you want to know more, if you want to do some more reading um, on food forests. And then here are some nurseries, again, um, in our Pacific Northwest region. 
Um, these are all great nurseries. Uh, nurseries where I have bought plants from for my plantings. Um, these are also good nurseries. And, and again, not an exhaustive list, right? We are fortunate in our region to have all kinds of great native plant um, nurseries and food plant nurseries. Um, but this is just to get you started and give you an idea. Um, another thing I want to mention about the nurseries is I have all their websites here. One of the ways I use these is not just to buy plants, but to do some research as well. A lot of these nurseries are really good about securing plant materials that are going to thrive in our region. Um, and a lot of them have really good descriptions of their plants and what they need to thrive. Um, some of the nurseries even offer classes that you can take. Um, so I will use these as a resource for, oh, my phone is going off, as a resource for, um, for doing some research as well. So you can think about using these in that way too. You can call a lot of these as well and ask some questions. A lot of them are very helpful um, and will give you information. This is an agroforestry newsletter that uh, we publish once a quarter. Um, and if you have further interest in food forests or these types of systems, uh, agroforestry systems, if you want to learn more, I would encourage you to sign up for this newsletter. Um, we always feature a landowner who's growing an agroforestry system in some way. We've done um, a newsletter on food forests already. Um, so you may be able to find some of our back issues. We have, we always feature a plant. We call it our agroforestry superstar. So we teach you about a plant. We give you recipes for that plant. We tell you um, some legends or tales about the plant. Um, and so it's just a cool resource if you are interested in um, learning more about these systems um, in, in Washington state. And then we also have a food forest survey. So food forests are growing um, in interest. We have a lot of people coming to us, asking us questions about these systems, asking us how to engage with food forests in some way. And so we thought we would put together a survey and see if there was a way that we could help to build out a network um, of information, a network where people could go and share resources and share knowledge and engage in some way. So this survey is asking you to kind of express your interest with food forests and how you might want to engage with others around this topic. So if you have interest and you have some time and you want to participate in this survey, um, please feel free. And lastly, I just want to say thank you. Um, these, these are all images of my food forests and some of my fellow creatures who share the food forest with me. Um, from my food forest to all of yours, whether they be new food forests or older food forests, thank you for joining me today and allowing me to share um, this topic of food forests with all of you. And that is my contact information. I'm always open to sharing more resources or answering questions about food forests. And with that, I will go ahead and open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Awesome. Can you hear me okay, Carrie? Yes. Great. Okay. So yeah, we've got, we, we got a ton of questions while you were talking and there was a ton of great questions. Um, I have, and I don't, I don't know how I did on time. So hopefully we have some time. Um, I'm not sure either, actually. <laughs> when, when are we supposed to be fully done? I think we said 1130, but I think people can stick around as long as they have questions. Probably we cut out about 1145. So 20 okay. minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. You might uh, throw us out though. Oh, okay. Well, we'll do. We'll do our best. We'll launch okay. in and we'll we'll address what we can. 
Okay, yeah. So what I'll say is I have consolidated a few that I heard repeated, and um, there was a few that got kind of partially answered in the chat. Um, and so I wanted to address the ones that weren't addressed. And then you guys always can um, contact Carrie or maybe your local conservation district uh, with any other questions that you have. So one that I heard um, a lot was about um, shady areas. Um, mm -hmm. People were asking, are there any uh, different things that they need to think about if they have shady areas or if they're planting under like a big cedar or a big hemlock? Are there vines that do well or not in the shade? Can you speak to that? Yeah, and so this is, what's cool is you have such a vast palette of plants to draw from to build these systems, right? And so if your area is shady, there are plants that will thrive in shady areas. If you're planting under, you know, our, our natural forest ecosystems here in Western Washington are very acidic, right? And so I hear someone saying, what if I'm planting under a cedar tree? Um, well, you're gonna have acidic soils. So what are some of the types of plants that will do well with the acid? Um, what are plants that will thrive in the shade? So there are lots of native greens that will thrive in shady spots ferns. We talked about the fiddleheads. There are berries, a lot of the huckleberries, our native red huckleberry, um, some of our, uh, the evergreen huckleberry. Um, so if you're planting around sort of an already natural forest ecosystem, I would encourage you first to explore a lot of our natives because they're already going to be adapted to that, to those soils, to those conditions, and they're already going to be adapted to those other trees like growing near a cedar tree or those types of things, right? And there's so many of those that have those edible and medicinal qualities. Um, if you're wanting to bring in other species, again, one of those ones that I mentioned, like the Camellia sinensis, the tea plant, right? It is a plant that natively thrives in a forest understory and can do well um, in some of those types of conditions. Um, if you have, again, also thinking about that where's that successional stage that you're in? So if you're talking about cedar trees and you have a lot of big dominant cedar trees and a relatively shaded understory, a, an understory that's in deep shade, then you're probably in a space that's representing that climax forest establishment, right? And if you have deep, deep shade in the understory of those trees, you're probably not going to grow a ton just because of the successional stage of what that ecosystem is in. So if you're wanting to get more diversity, more biodiversity, you may have to create some disturbance or you may have to select a different spot. You know, I'm not saying let's all go in and find our climax forest and, and rip out half the trees. I'm not saying that. Um, you're either, but these are your options, right? You're either going to have to create some disturbance there or find a different spot to do your food forest. Um, so also thinking about where you're landing um, in that succession with where you're trying to plant. Awesome. Um, great. And then I had, there's so many questions, but I'm just choosing some that I feel like might be um more general and useful to everybody. Um, somebody asked, is there um, a recommended way for getting rid of weeds without using pesticides within your food forest situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of the methods I like to use is, um, and the term is the, the the term is leaving my mind, but essentially like shading it out or so um, putting down like the black um, shade cloth, the black um, agricultural cloth. Um, you can put that down and kill things out that way. You can layer cardboard, um, layers of cardboard and then mulch on top. Now this takes time, right? So 
this is going to take potentially six months, nine months, maybe a year, depending on what kind of weeds you're dealing with. Some are harder than others. Um, but that's a really great method. Now, your food forest is going to take time anyway. I do want to, you know, I hope I conveyed that well. Be patient with these systems. These systems ask for time and grace of time. They ask for patience. Um, and so, yeah, something like that will take time, but it's an effective way to get weeds out um, without the use of chemicals or herbicides, things like that. But when those weeds are gone, when they've died back, you do need to be need to be ready to insert something in its place. So you don't want to pull away your your black cloth or your you know let your cardboard break down and then come back in two years because those weeds are going to come right back. So you're going to have to have something, be ready and have something to insert in their place. Awesome. Well, I don't know if we're going to get kicked out right at 1130. So should I continue with questions? We, we, we can keep going. We should be fine. Keep going. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. Another question. Oh, yeah. This one was asked very early on, and I'm curious, too. Um, can you speak any more to, like, specific benefits for birds? Um, I can gather that, like, it'll provide habitat and food and insects and stuff like that. But um, somebody asked that. And so, yeah, just curious. Well, and that's absolutely it, right? You're, you're building in, you're building in refugia, you're building in places for them to nest, you're building in food for them, you're bringing in all these, you're attracting all these insects, right? So, and I will say, when you get these systems established, you're going to have things that want to share your food with you, right? Birds, small mammals, um, things like that are going to come in and they're going to want some of the food that you're producing. Um, and so, you know, you may want to be in that mindset that, well, I'm going to be okay with sharing some of my food, right? That bird might eat, you know, some of my berries or things like that. You know, you may have to net something, but yeah, you're going to be creating the, the habitat that the birds need. So, and they need, you know, what do they need to thrive? They need food, they need shelter, they need um, places to nest and rear their young, right? All of those things you're going to start providing for them. Um, and so that they will come, they will come. <laughs> Awesome. Um, let's see. So I have a couple other questions that were kind of, I'll ask this one. Um, uh, there was a question about any advice that you might have for fortifying eroding land. And I know that that is like an issue that could be attributed to so many things that it's, it's probably best if you have somebody come look at your specific site so they can assess the specific area. But I was wondering if you had any general um, advice for that kind of thing. Well, yeah, I, I absolutely would recommend having someone from a local cons conservation district come and see, first off, what's going on? Why is your landscape eroding? You know, and see if you can get at some of the core issues there. Um, as far as addressing it, I, I assume we're talking towards plants and things like that. I, you know, there's a yeah. lot of ways, a lot of great plants in our environment that are really good at, um, helping to secure eroding bluffs or lands or things like that. And you want kind of a combination of plants. So you're going to want to get some shrubs, some kind of fast growing shrubs on the landscape, things like um, uh, red osier dogwood, things like if it's wet, maybe some willow, um, things like um, nine bark, um, those types of things. So fast growing shrubs that get kind of roots out fast into the soil profile, but you're gonna to wanna to combine that then with some slower growing trees, right? So have a good combination. 
because over time you want you want some fast root structure to hold things in place critically now but over time you're going to want those slower growing deeper rooted trees um like doug fir or um western hemlock or shore pine or whatever um to help um with yeah with more security over time uh yeah hopefully i don't know yeah hopefully no I awesome know. i uh and yeah just to specify i think that people were asking that in the context of like a food forest and so i think that oh, that yeah. advice okay. totally like plays in so it absolutely plays in um and what i would do i mean so if it's going to be a food forest on this slope degrading space you know building in the food trees and shrubs you want, but also incorporating some of those native trees and shrubs as well, right? right. Uh, so currants, you know, currants are going to grow quickly and grow a root structure quickly. That would be a, a food forest shrub that would do that. Um, a walnut tree or a chestnut tree might be one of the older growing trees you might want to put on there. Um, big leaf maple um would be a great native tree that you might want to put on um to um and you could get syrup from that big leaf maple eventually when it gets old enough but uh to get some good structure and things so yeah absolutely trees and shrubs fast growing shrubs slower growing trees getting them into that soil cool um great and then uh another question that i saw a lot which i I, I kind of answered with, well, all of the things that Carrie, or Carrie is talking about is scalable, but I'd love to get your answer to this question. A lot of people were asking, I have a small amount of space. I have a yard. I have a half acre. Can I do this? Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to hear your advice on that. Absolutely. I mean, you can, this can be as simple, as I said, as a tree guild, right? And I'll, I'll go back to one of those pictures where I had a tree guild. Where did I have a tree guild? There, in the corner here, right? So this can be as small as you selecting, you know, if you have a very small space to work with, you can certainly plant out a food system in this way. You are, you're gonna have to have a tree to make it a food forest. Um, but it can be, it could be a dwarf, you know, one of those dwarf fruit trees. If your space is real tiny, it could be a dwarf fruit tree, two or three berry shrubs, some perennial vegetables, um, and, you know, maybe some roots, uh, you know, some root crops or something like that built all around your tree, right? In this form, and this picture illustrates it kind of, right? You're building in and around your tree in this little tiny mini ecosystem. So we can be that small um, to, I, I live on an acre and I have probably a quarter acre uh, planted in a food forest, right? So I've got a quarter of my yard that I planted in a food forest. Um, so it can be, and then, you know, and then it can be scaled up to five acres or 10. So you really can scale it to as tiny as just a little miniature tree guild. Um, the, the key is, is building in as much diversity as you can and thinking about how the plants are gonna relate to each other. Um, and this is really one of the simplest ways to start a food forest is start with that one tree guild. Pick the one tree that you want to start with, consider the plants to incorporate around that, and build that out and see how it works. And then when you're comfortable with it and you have space, you can add more tree guilds. And over time, you've, you've got a relatively robust food forest. Laura, you are muted if you're talking. It looked like you were talking. I was, but <laughs> it's all good. Now you can hear me, yeah? <laughs> um, so another question that we got that I feel like might apply to a lot of folks is, um, do you have any advice for pet safety in terms of planting certain stuff? Is there any resources for 
um, making sure that your pets are safe while you're planting all these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you have small children, if you have pets, right. Um, be conscious of what you're planting. There are great lists out there of things. I would start, you know, maybe if you're concerned, I would start with things not to plant. <laughs> and there are great lists out there, right? Uh, plants that are toxic to dogs, right? Um, plants that are toxic to cats, um, those types of things. A lot of the food plants and things like that that you're probably going to put into your food forest um, are probably going to be okay, right? And then there, there are the ones that we know about, um, rhubarb, for example. You wouldn't want your dog to go out and chew on rhubarb leaves or tomatoes, um, a lot of the nightshades, right? Um, so yeah, that is definitely a consideration. If you have small children, if you have pets, and you know, if you're curious, you can ask. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have an exhaustive list in my head. Um, a lot, there are so many food plants that are safe, that are perfectly safe though, that you can feel good about. So you definitely have a broad spectrum of stuff that you don't have to worry about and you can feel perfectly safe with. Um, but if you do have a plant or two that you're suspect about, um, look it up, ask someone. There's lots of good information out there about that, but absolutely a consideration if you have small children, if you have pets that you're concerned about. Cool. Um, let's see. So another question that we got, this one I'll read because, um, because I will. So it's from, well, it doesn't matter who it's from, but the question is, um, Curious whether a thriving food forest generally has a lot of bare mulched areas without plants growing on them. I've seen food forests depicted as very tightly knit landscapes of ground cover, vines, trees, shrubs, without a lot of unplanted areas. Is that the best practice? These are gonna all look different over time, right? So you when you're seeing different images and let me see if i can just find some okay so look here we have some new food forests right um the images here that are that are newly established so when you see a young food forest you're probably going to see a lot more bare ground um just because of the time it takes for establishment and the the time, the energy, the resources it takes, right? The first kind of first things you're focused on in a food forest tend to be the trees and the shrubs, right? And so you'll see young food forests that are really dominant in those tree and shrub layers. And maybe they haven't gotten into the ground layers as much yet, right? And then as you see a food forest getting older, and this, these are some uh, photos of my food forest, right? And so you can see, I started with my trees and shrubs. I mulched out. Um, you can see I'm starting to get in the ground layer stuff in here. I've got, and this was my food forest probably at year three. Um, if I took a picture now, my food forest about seven years old. You would see a lot more mints, a lot more um, native greens. So my younger food forest, you saw a lot more kind of mulched bare ground. Now that my food forest is more mature, you're seeing a lot more of the ground cover in there and it's looking a lot more dense. So I think part of that could just be the age of the food forest you're looking at. Part of it can be people's aesthetic as well, right? These systems can be super, super complex and tightly knit. They can be a little more simplified, like just a tree guild as well, like this, right? Here's a lawn and here's a tree guild built in there. Um, so that's the other beauty of these systems. You can get as complex as you want, or you can simplify these down. Now, the more complex you get, the more of those ecosystem benefits and things and habitat you'll create, but you don't have to be super complex to be having a food forest type of structure and ecosystem. So I, hopefully that got at the question. <laughs> I think so. I mean, 
I'm not the person who asked, but that helped me understand more. Um, cool. So I, I think I have like two more questions for you, if we could fit it in in the next two, two minutes. Um, one question is, how does agroforestry relate to permaculture? What is the relationship there? Yeah. Permaculture and agroforestry are very similar. Um, I would say, and they use a lot of similar practices and things like that. Permaculture is usually expressed more at a smaller scale and more um, philosophically, like a way of life and those types of things. Whereas agroforestry is more of, I would say, um, expressed um, as something to be scaled up, as a kind of scientifically studied. Now, I'm not saying that permaculture doesn't have a lot of good science and research behind their practices. They do. Um, but agroforestry is probably established more as a body of, of research and science than permaculture might be um, and is definitely seen at being scaled up to larger and larger scales. But lots of overlap there. Lots of overlap, um, especially at the smaller scales. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So last question, um, which I think is really relevant, especially around here in the Pacific Northwest where we have a ton of storm water. Uh, somebody asked, can you talk about irrigation systems uh, when it's still a new food forest, like in the beginning stages? Yeah. So, yeah, there's... Um, Yes. So when, when your food forest is young, when you are trying to get it established, you most likely are going to have to provide it some irrigation, some water. Um, and oh my gosh, I don't know how to constructively talk about this in a broad way. Um, I mean, it's, it's really going to depend on where this system is. You know, ideally you have maybe a roof structure nearby and you can do some great um, rainwater collection or something like that and then can hook that up to like a drip irrigation line. Ideally, maybe, you know, even if you don't have the rainwater collection, maybe you have some drip irrigation that you can put on a timer. Um, maybe, I mean, it can, to be honest, if this is in a small space in your backyard, you can just go out and water it with a hose every now and then too, you know? Um, if, if this is large scale on a big open space on a farm or something like that, and you're not close to irrigation, um, there are ways that you can time your planting, right? Planting your trees and shrubs in the winter, for example, and allowing them a longer time in the ground to establish their root systems before you get into a hotter, drier, drier time of the year. Um, mulching the soil really well, right? Making sure the soil's covered really well. So there are some methods and techniques you can use if you're not going to have access to water. Um, yeah. That's what I got for now. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's probably all the questions that we have time for, so. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. It looks like Kari will close us out. Yeah, I just wanted to um, just share one more thing that we have one more class in this series, and we are really grateful to our partners with King County Wastewater Treatment Division um, and Snohomish Conservation District, where the three of us work now. Um, thank you, Carrie. This was really wonderful. I think people got a lot out of it. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous, and now they're excited to plan their food for us. So thanks so much. Laura, great job with questions, and thanks to Monica as well for helping us kick off. So we hope to see uh, you online on March 11th, again, for our Living with Wildlife class. And with that, I will close this, us out for the day. Um, we will be sending out the recording um, as well 